get ready. It's going to be a great evening. <laughs> I just, On July 1st, our Burke so, Club is meeting, yeah. and they will be reading Homegoing by Yah Yazi, which follows the parallel path of sisters and their descendants through eight yes. generations from the Gold Coast yeah, right, to plantations right. in the Mississippi, from the Civil War to Harlem. It's going to be a great, um, a great book and discussion. In our August book club, we're going to be uh, reading Mike Madrid's new book as well. July 8th at the Peacock Theater, 1 p.m., 10,000 black men named George. The title refers to all the Pullman porters being called George by white passengers, which was considered a racial slur. So it should be a great movie. And then finally, uh, in uh, four weeks, July 11th, here in the Fireside Room at 4, the League of Women Voters will be here to present a program on mis- and disinformation, particularly in regarding the 2024 election cycle. So that looks to be very good, and now we're going to have Katha introduce our speaker. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So nice to see you. Uh, and welcome, uh, Susan just said, to our June. Thank goodness for Democrats and our um, So, but before we begin, doing research on this program and on uh, the Contra Costa Bar Association, I have to say that Walnut Creek was involved in that, and I want to tell you a little bit of the history. In the early years, there were two bar associations in Contra Costa County, the Richmond or West Contra Costa Bar and the Contra Costa County Bar Association. So Richmond's population doubled during World War II, a lot of uh, military defense industry, due to the naval shipyards and became the city with the largest number of lawyers, Richmond. Meanwhile, Walnut Creek had one lawyer, Forrest Bailey, it's like Forrest Gump or George Bailey, to serve a population of 3,000 people. The Ring Brothers followed soon after, and by 1952, there were 10 to 20 lawyers in Walnut Creek. In 1955, the small group of Walnut Creek attorneys used to get together for lunch. And at one of these lunches, they decided to form a legal aid clinic. So for reasons unknown, the county bar refused to assume sponsorship of the legal aid and referral service, and the Walnut Creek attorneys thus formed because they were not happy, the Central Contra Costa Bar Association in 1958. Bar meetings were held either at the Don Hotel or Paul's Restaurant, which neither of which I think exist anymore, in Martinez, and state bar dues were $25. I'm happy that having to trek to Richmond's municipal court, the Central County Group filed a, a celebrated lawsuit that successfully established a municipal court in Concord, and a similar suit was filed to establish the Walnut Creek Municipal Court because they did not want to drive to Richmond or Martinez. And so we have. So, and I have to tell you just quickly, office work, if you were looking for a lawyer from Contra Costa, Costa Bar, $20 an hour. Down from $25 an hour the two years before. Real estate purchase agreement, $50. Contract, $25. General partnership agreement, $100. A will, $15. Trial per day, $175. Wouldn't Trump be thrilled with that? And depositions in defense cases, $50. There we go. So too bad we didn't have to go to court in those days. Anyway, on to the speaker. Jonathan Lee has served as an assistant U.S. attorney in the Northern California District since 2005, but is here today in a personal capacity only. He received his JD degree from Georgetown University Law Center, and while at Georgetown, he was a member of the Center for Applied Legal Studies Advocacy Clinic representing clients in D.C. Superior Court and before the Social Security Administration. So I'm really very happy that we have an advocate for Social Security, which is near and dear to our hearts in this community. We are the headquarters of pre-existing conditions, but we definitely need our Social Security. So you can, you can advise us if something terrible happens. 
He received his undergraduate degree in history and economics from Washington University in St. Louis. His role in man is managing other assistant U.S. attorneys and working on prosecutions involving organized crime. And his most recent trial involved a murder of a federal security guard at the Oakland Federal Courthouse by anti-government extremists. Was that during the after the George Floyd? So do you remember the security guard that was murdered by a person pretending to be part of the uh, protest group? So thank you. He's the chair of the Contra Costa County Bar Association's Port Chicago Task Force, which was born in 2021. And he's also a director of the Contra Costa County Bar Association. He's the vice president for government, government relations in the Federal Bar Association's Northern California chapter. He's presented and assisted with the presentation of historical programs about Port Chicago to a variety of audiences this past year, including churches and high schools and social clubs and political clubs like ours, members of the federal judiciary, Congress, uh, California General Assembly, city council members. In fact, I think you have checked every box. <laughs> He enjoys working with others in the movement seeking exoneration of the Port Chicago 50, including the other members of the task force, which includes lawyers and non-lawyers. So I want him to know, and his team to know, that to demonstrate support for the exoneration, in February 2023, our Bay Area congressional representatives, Congress people Mark DeSalmi, Barbara Lee, and John Garamendi, introduced a House resolution recognizing the victims of the disaster, and the bill has yet to pass in the Senate. And last January, the Democrat, Democratic Party of Contra Costa County, to which our club belongs, passed a resolution supporting the work of the Bar Association's Port Chicago Task Force. So I just want to read the last paragraph. The resolution concludes the DP tri the Triple C, Democratic Party of Contra Costa County, a firm support for all future efforts while urging the President, the Congress, the Secretary of the Navy to take all necessary actions to restore honor to and rectify mistreatment by the U.S. military of any sailors who were unjustly blamed for and convicted of mutiny after the Port Chicago disaster, which occurred in the town of Port Chicago, California in 1944. So I wanted to share our support for this work and the support of our Congress people. So please, welcome Jonathan Lee. Thank you, Captain, for that lovely introduction. And thank you, everyone, for being here and for the opportunity. This is a true privilege and honor to be addressing. Uh, my understanding is that this is the most active uh, political group in the county. The and maybe States. beyond that, right? Yes. So it is a great honor to be here with you and to be able to tap into your already existing energy around issues of importance in our public discourse. And that's, we're bringing another issue before you now. It's one that we feel we should, as locals here in the Bay Area, take greater ownership of than perhaps we have in the past few generations. We're coming up on the 80th anniversary of the Port Chicago disaster, about five weeks from July 17. 80 years. It's been 80 years, and the, the stain on the nation's history remains, and it's something that we are actively and very vigorously working on trying to remove. We need your help. And that's one of the reasons why I was so delighted to accept this invitation on behalf of the task force to talk to you today. So, I'd like to start with, what is the question? Uh, we're gonna answer several questions today. Some of them are specific. What happened in the disaster? What happened at the mutant trial? Why is that wrong? But operating in the background, the overarching question, and one that we, I know that you ask every day as you go about your lives and as you become involved in political issues and causes, is, what kind of United States do we want this to be? I think we all care about the answer to that overarching question. Um, I came of age during the 1970s, uh, 
one of my earliest memories of a political dispute was uh, gas prices and the lines at the gas stations during the Carter administration and then the hostage crisis. I know uh, some of you are, are, you know, came of age before I did, others of you came of age after I did, and that's fine. But all of us are united by the idea that we care about this country and we care about what kind of country we are. And we want to place in context <coughs> this particular issue of the Port Chicago 50. So we have to go back to the 1940s and remember that this was a very a decade when the country was uh, really riven by domestic problems as well as trying to contend with worldwide conflict before the dawn of the modern civil rights era. It was before Brown versus Board of Education, before Emmett Till was murdered, it was before Medgar Evers was murdered. We have to go back to the 1940s when African American men serving this country fought in Europe, fought for our democratic values and principles, and they fought in the Pacific Theater. Sometimes they were conscripted, sometimes they enlisted. They <clears throat> served their country. And when they returned after the war, they returned to a country that was still uh, driven by Jim Crow. There are many instances of violence being visited upon uh, African American servicemen upon their return to this country. You may know the story of Sergeant Isaac Woodard, who uh, came back and was in his uh, full uniform on a bus from Atlanta to his home in South Carolina. The bus made a stop at a gas station near Aiken, South Carolina. He was pulled off the bus. He was assaulted. He was maimed. He was actually blinded uh, because he had the temerity to come back to the southern states wearing a uniform of the United States military. That's the context in which Port Chicago happened. Jim Crow segregation and African American servicemen were not held in esteem. In fact, they threatened the very order of this country at that time domestically, at the same time that they were fighting to ensure that these, our democratic values survive. We have to remember that context because in Port Chicago, the men were loading ammunition. And they were loading ammunition under circumstances that were, that were very dangerous. It was chaotic. The work was uh, round the clock. They were pressed to move faster. And they were the, the poor Chicago 50 are the only men who have ever been held to account for the explosion of the case. Just think about that for a minute. They didn't choose the task that they were given. They pointed out that it was unsafe. The explosion occurred. They then cleaned up the site, picking up body parts. White sailors were given bereavement leave. They were not. Then they were ordered back to work. And when they declined because of the conditions, they were tried as mutineers. And no officer was ever held to account for any of that. That is the context that we're talking about. So I know you care about this question, but I wanted to start there and make sure that we were all thinking of this from that orientation and that perspective. Let me tell you a little bit about what we are doing first before we go back into history. We formed a task force in 2021, and we have about 20 members. There are members of the bar, as you've heard, and there are non-lawyers. Some of those folks are here today. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna introduce them because I think you need to see who they are. Uh, Carol Lucido is here by the camera, and Carol has been a stalwart member of the task force from the beginning and has done many tasks to support the work of the group, including our uh, web page. We encourage you to go and find it. There's lots of resources there. We also have Dave Millenfar. Dave, can you stand up? Dave is a high school. Yes, let's give him a round of applause. Dave is a high school student who is interested in justice. And he reached out through his parents to see if there was something he could do. Uh, I would encourage you, if you're not already on TikTok, make sure you go there and follow the content that Gabe is uh, putting up. Gabe will also be uh, helping us along with Drew Irons. Drew, can you stand up, please? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Drew has also supported the work of the task force through these many months. Gabe and Drew will be in the foyer afterwards 
and there are iPads there. If you would like to sign our petition, it will be very easy for you to do that with their assistance before you leave, and we'll come back and tell you more about that later. Here's a picture of us uh, as a group, those of us who could be there last year on the commemoration event, which is at the site of the explosion. The flagpole is, uh, uh, marks the uh, National Park Service's jurisdiction at the site. This is the National Memorial Naval Magazine at Port Chicago. And you can see the pilings of the pier in the background over uh, folks' shoulders on the left. That was the pier that was destroyed in the explosion. So it is the site. It is surrounded by active army. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a military base that's currently being operated by the army. The services switch jurisdiction. It'll be back to the Navy at some point. But in order to get there, you have to make a reservation, you have to make arrangements because it's an active military base. At this point, this small point that is dedicated to the memorial. There will be a commemoration uh, this year again on July 20th, that's the 80th. Uh, you can attend that if you like. You have to go to the Park Service uh, website and request a ticket. I encourage you, it's a very moving event where family members and descendants of the men who were, died, who were killed in the explosion, as well as men who served there, are in attendance, they're recognized. And sometimes there are remarks by dignitaries that are actually worth hearing. <laughs> and I encourage you to give that a try. Uh, last year, we were honored, we were actually given a mic for a couple of minutes to explain our work. And so, I'm not, I don't think that will happen this year, but the, the speeches are very moving there as well. So that's on July 20th, Saturday. All right, that's us, that's our group. You heard about uh, how we're active. Uh, we do think that the the simplest way to exonerate these men is for the Secretary of the Navy to um, pick up the pen and sign the paperwork. That's all it will take. It doesn't take an act of Congress. Um, I will say that there are many great ideas right now that go to the halls of Congress and die a slow death. Right? Mm -hmm. And so counting on Congress in this environment, I think, is, is putting your chips on the wrong horse. Um, I do applaud our local representatives who have been introducing the resolution with every new Congress. So every two years they introduce it. And it's passed. When the Democrats have controlled the House, they have passed it. Where it's faltered is in the Senate when they try to pass the National Defense Authorization Act, which is the omnibus, omnibus bill that funds our military. It's usually inserted along with literally scores of other writers into that huge bill. And then there's a conference process, and there's a filtering out, and it's always gotten filtered out. So it hasn't passed the Senate. Chances are that politics has something to do with this, right? Well, the Navy is in a different posture. The Navy is part of the executive branch, and they, the secretary reports to the president. Uh, it's a cabinet level position, and has the authority to remove the convictions from their personal records. And we're going to give you some ideas about how if you want to raise your voice and make sure the Secretary of the Navy hears, there's some simple things that you could do. And oh, by the way, the Secretary of the Navy may be coming to the ceremonies at the 80th celebration. Wow. Now, I'll give you an example of how in the last couple of years, the tide has kind of turned. Last June, on Juneteenth, the Navy announced that they were exonerating a group called the Philadelphia 15. This was a World War II incident in 1940. Fifteen men on a submarine wrote a letter of protest to the Pittsburgh Courage, which at the time was a national circulation African American publication. It's one of seven. And they wrote a letter to the editor saying, basically, moms and dads of African American kids don't let your sons enlist in the Navy because they will just be nothing more than servants to the white, white sailors. For that, they were disciplined, they were expelled from the Navy. And 80 years later, the Navy is on there. It was not a mutiny situation, but it was a full exoneration of World War II era African American sailors. That was June. On Juneteenth, that was announced last year. Then in November, in connection with Veterans Day, the Army announced that it was removing the convictions of the Camp Logan Buffalo Soldiers. This goes back to 1917, there were 110 men 
they actually took up arms and they went into the city of Houston and they rioted over the deplorable conditions, racist conditions that they had been subjected to. They shot and killed at least one white police officer. You can imagine that the, the, that the, the justice needed out to them was swift. 110 men, 10 were just summarily hanged. The other 100 were convicted in a trial that lasted, I forget whether it was one hour or two hours. And the trial was filled with irregularities. They were all convicted of mutiny. 106 years later, the army exonerated all 110. And that just happened about seven months ago. So when I feel that my spirits are flagging a little bit, my enthusiasm is not what it should be, I try to remember we're living in an era where this could actually happen. And it's our job to do everything we can to try to make it happen. I'm going to tell you there are a number of men that we could talk about. I'm going to focus on three. This is Joseph R. Small Sr. This is a picture that was taken in 1943, shortly before he shipped out to the Great Lakes Naval Training Station outside Chicago. From there, he went to Fort Chicago, which is here locally. He was uh, accused of being a ringleader. Uh, he was 23 years old, and he was somewhat of a leader. He had great, apparently, natural leadership qualities, and he was able to call them into formation. And even though he didn't have the rank of petty officer, the petty officers deferred to him to call the cadence and to get the men to where they were supposed to be, whether it's loading ammunition or anywhere else. He also was someone who would speak his mind, and he had the temerity, again, to speak up and say, these conditions are hazardous, this whole thing is going to blow up, and that's before they explode. Now, you would think that at a subsequent trial involving charges of mutiny, evidence of that statement would be relevant. It would go to a number of issues that would be relevant. It was excluded. None of the, uh, none of the, there was no evidence permitted that explained the conditions that the men faced before the explosion, their reactions to those conditions, the statements they made about it, requests that they made for training, none of that was admitted as evidence. Mr. Small uh, lived a long life after the war. He um, was interviewed by Dr. Robert Allen, who was a leading scholar on this. I commend his book to you, The Poor Chicago Review Me. It would, be, it would make a great study for uh, book clubs or reading groups. It is, a, it is the definitive description of the trial and everything that's wrong with it. He was interviewed by uh, Dr. Allen in the late 1970s. And he explained in excruciating detail how the conviction prevented him from living the kind of full life that he wanted to live. He couldn't get financing for his small business, which meant that he couldn't uh, pay for the home that he and his family wanted, uh, lived in. So he built his home. Well, the, the city wouldn't give him the permits, and they hassled him about the home. He then subsequently lost his business fighting with the city. It was one travail after the other, stemming from the fact that the conviction meant that he didn't get an honorable discharge. Anyone who knows anything about post-World War II America knows that the GI Bill provided a pathway to prosperity for tens of millions of Americans. Because the men who came home from the war, the country would remember them, would remember their service and provided a means for them to succeed in society. It did not happen for the Fortune Chicago This is Jack Crittenden. He was 19 years old when the explosion happened. Most of the men that we're going to talk about were between 17 and 23 years old. They were all from the South, the Mid Atlantic, or Northern states. None of them were California. Many of the white officers who presided over their operations were here locally. They weren't in a forward position for other reasons. And they would come from their home to the base and run the base and then go back to their home in Oakland, El Cerrito, or wherever it was. Jack Ferdinand was 19, as I said. He actually uh, had decided that he was prepared to load ammunition after the explosion although he was concerned about it. And he thought that he was being taken by the MP to a squad that would be reporting for work. Instead, he was taken to the brig, 
and he was charged along with the other 49 with mutiny. It didn't matter that at the trial he explained that he would have gone back to work. He was deemed a mutineer, he was convicted, he received a sentence of 15 years of hard labor that most of the men received. After the war, he went back to Alabama and he, uh, he went back to Alabama State, which is an HBCU school, and he was able to work his way, he completed his degree, he became a teacher, he became a history teacher in Lowndes County, Alabama. And Lowndes County is also known as Bloody Lowndes because through the history of the state, it was one of the locations where uh, a great number of lynchings had occurred through history. So the idea that this gentleman went back to Alabama and was teaching history in that location has always struck me as very, very significant. Uh, he, uh, he died in, in uh, 2017, and his son, uh, Hiram, is somebody that we've been in touch with. We're trying to offer support uh, to family members whenever we can. Hiram will actually be making a petition to the Navy. Uh, he's represented by counsel. He has an excellent counsel. We help to make the introduction. So there is going to be a legal petition, uh, at least one, coming to the Navy soon. This is John B. Fellisbrett. Uh, he is 17 years old in that photograph. He was at Port Chicago for two weeks. He arrived on July 3rd, and he died in the explosion on July 17th. His family, yeah, he's from New Jersey. His family was told simply that he died while serving. No details for him for years. And his uh, nephew, Jason, is an active member of our task force. His grandniece, uh, Camille, has helped us with presentations. And we'll be coming back, I understand, next month. We have a conference, and we want to tell you about our conference in case you'd like to attend. It's free. We just need you to register. We'll be at the Concord Health Week on July 19th from 1 to 3. And there will be panels of different speakers there that you might find interesting. But I want John's picture to be here because he represents the men who died in the explosion, who died needlessly through the chaos and hazard created by white officers. But there's really no other way to think about it. All right, we're talking about the explosion. Let's just back up and cover a little bit, uh, tell you the story of the disaster very quickly. You might be familiar with it already, uh, but just, just to fill in some of the basic details so we're all on the same page. This is an aerial view of the site in about 1941 when it was constructed. This was intended to be uh, the most significant ammunition depot um, for the Pacific Theater. And it was constructed quickly in early 1942 and went into operation by late 1943. There was later a second pier added. This picture is early and just shows the single pier. This is a, a photo from the period at the location showing the men uh, removing ammunition from a railroad car. So the ammo would be brought in, and then it would be removed from there and placed aboard the ship and sent off to the Pacific there. This is the configuration of the two ships that were present at the time of the explosion. The, the EA Bryan is on the bottom, and it was loaded with, it, maybe your math is better than mine, but you can see it's many hundreds of tons of ammunition. Um, they're loaded, and the, the ship at the top, the Quinault Victory, had not yet been loaded. But in addition to what's on the Bryan, all of the railroad cars that are shown there in the middle part of the picture, so it's a bird's eye perspective looking down, those are all loaded up as well. So when the explosion was triggered, all of that exploded. It was the, it was the largest explosion in recorded history caused by man to that point. Was felt as far away as San Francisco, I think even the ports of San Jose. Double tremor was on the Richter scale, it would have been somewhere between 3.5 and 3.7. Uh, there was a plane flying over the site at 15,000 feet that reported large objects uh, flying up in the air where it was flying. Windows were broken in Venetia, which is all the way across the strait. So 
a huge, massive explosion. Only 51 of the 303 men who died in the explosion were identifiable. The rest were just scattered body parts and remains. Uh, and they, they know who was on the ship because of assignment, but there was no confirmation by identification of remains in most of the cases. The explosion was just too massive and too forceful. Here are some photographs showing the site uh, as a result of the explosion. This is one of the piers. This is the Quinault Victory. Remember I mentioned that was the ship that was empty. It was, it was flung out into the Carquina Strait about 700 yards and also rotated about 260 degrees from where it was. So that was all because of the explosion. All right, so after the explosion, that's July 17th, the Navy first convened a court of inquiry. This was an administrative proceeding to try to determine if it could or caused the explosion. It was not able to reach a definitive conclusion. It did receive uh, witness testimony from a member of the White uh, uh, Command Officers, and uh, I, won't, uh, I won't read that testimony to you, but I'll just tell you my description. Many of these White Officers spent their time in this proceeding talking about the, uh, what they perceived to be the intellectual inadequacies of the black sailors. Um, the intimation being that, of course, there was an explosion because look at what we're working with. So that lasted about two weeks. Congress then took up the question of uh, what compensation should be given because these are, these are men who are in active service. The original bill in Congress proposed $5,000 for each family of a deceased victim. There was a representative from the South, from Mississippi, named Rankin, who once he learned that most of the beneficiaries of this program would be African American families, he insisted that they scale the number back to 3,000. So it was 3,000, and those, you know, I know you all know your history really well, but that fraction of three-fifths is a very significant historical reference, of course, to the original Constitution which said that we count black residents as three-fifths of a person. Also mentioned that the white, uh, the white sailors who were at Port Chicago, and there were hundreds of them, uh, got bereavement leave, 30 days with pay. Black sailors did not. All right, let's talk about the mutiny trial. This followed the court of inquiry. This was a trial that happened over the course of two months. It happened at Yerba Buena Island. And a little historical footnote, just in the last few months, they've actually found the courtroom. Wow. Uh, historians have concluded that they've located the courtroom, and they're now going to uh, refurbish it and preserve it as part of the historical site there. You can visit it. I'm sure there will be displays there. I do have a photograph I can show you, but picture a, a room at Yerba Buena Island in a base and a trial that lasted five weeks, and that'll give you some idea of what happened. Well, how did we get from the court of inquiry to the Navy? The way we got there is that the Navy decided that uh, they would resume the look of ammunition at Port Chicago. And the word came down through the chain of command that uh, the black sailors were going to go back to this work. Originally, 258 of them declined, saying that it was unsafe. While the, uh, their lieutenant and then later an admiral made statements that they perceived as threatening their lives, the admiral said, it would be safer for you to be loading ammunition than it would to be facing a firing squad. So of the 258 men, 208 returned to work. Uh, one detail there that I do want to share is there was a set of brothers in the 258. Uh, one brother went back to work, and one is in the Port Chicago pit. Later at the trial, the brother who went back to work, the statement that he gave was used as evidence against his brother in the trial. These statements were taken by Navy lawyers who did a variety of things that are problematic. For example, 
saying, I'm here to help you, uh, saying, uh, here's what happened, didn't it? And when the sailor would say, I don't think that's what happened, the lawyer would write up a version, show it to the sailor and say, I think you should sign this, this would be best for you. The sailor signs it, that then became their statement. On August the 9th, the men were formed and marched as if they were to go back to where they were. They reached a point at Mare Island, which is where they were at that time, where it was clear that they were going back to work, and they turned and went a different direction. That became the mutiny. That is the specific catalyst that the Navy pointed to as Here's the picture of the trial that I want you to see. You'll notice on the left, from the center and all the way to the left, there are four, there's actually a fifth lawyer facing the camera. And those are the five lawyers that represented the 50 defendants. The defendants are arrayed behind them. And then on the right hand side, mostly out of view, are the prosecutors. Now, so far, what I've been telling you is it's, it's a pretty dark story. This is our history. This is, this is our shared history. We all live in Contra Costa County. Um, it's, a, it's a couple of generations ago, but this is, this is our area. This is our history. There is a bright side here. And I want to start by saying that if you are interested in advocating for exoneration, you will get to walk in the footsteps of Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall at this time was legal counsel for the NAACP based in New York City. And he and Charles Houston had already been very active for over a decade, crisscrossing the country, mostly in the South, advocating for civil rights. And again, this is before the modern civil rights movement, it goes back to the 1930s. One of the projects they pursued was trying to find a case that could go to the Supreme Court that would establish the principle that if you're going to be tried for a capital offense in this country, you can't exclude everyone from the jury that is black. If you're a black defendant, there have to be black residents who are eligible to serve on that jury. And that was not the law, and it was not apparent that that would ever be the law. But today we take that for granted. Uh, Thurgood Marshall and Charles Houston put miles on their, on their lives crossing this country, fighting for issues like that, and many others. But he, he learned about this incident, the, the mutant trial, and he sought permission. During wartime, you had to have special permission to travel domestically like this. The government gave him permission. He was actually fairly close to Eleanor Roosevelt as a friend, so he could get that kind of permission. He came here, he observed the trial, the Navy wouldn't let him represent anyone. They had to be represented by Navy lawyers. But he did observe, and he held a couple of press conferences, and he pointed out that the proceedings were deeply flawed, inconsistent with our basic uh, principles of justice. That is the same, some of those arguments are the same arguments that we are using today. And so, it does feel like we are continuing the work of one of the giants of our country. We got a hold of his brief because after the, the guilty verdict, the Navy did let him represent the men in an appeal to Secretary Forrest. So we filed a brief as NAACP counsel on their behalf. And here's a couple of excerpts, and we actually snipped the actual typewritten documents of this is actually the document itself, excerpted for us to see here today. And in case that's too small for you to see, I'll just read it quickly. This says, mass prosecutions of this type, calculated to dispose of a large group of men with one swoop, militate against our whole traditional concept of personal guilt, in the hope that by proper administration of our procedure, an innocent man shall never be convicted through a callous indifference as to the fairness and integrity of the trial to which he is subjected. The men were tried as a group. The evidence was brought against one and against all. 
There was no differentiation of what they might have said or what they might have done. As I told you with Jack Curtin, in his case, and he's not alone, he was actually thinking that he was going back to work and he was then in charge. Contrast that with, just to use a modern example, um, and this has been in the news for the last few years, contrast that with the highly individualized evaluation of each particular person in the January 6th prosecutions. Charging decisions are different, bail decisions are different, uh, sentences are different, and they're muted out according to personal responsibility and the conduct of each individual. That's our tradition. That's what we do. Here's another uh, excerpt from Marshall. This one talks about how the transcript is 1,435 pages, single spaced and on the legal size paper, and the court arrived at its findings of guilty between 11.55 a.m. and 1.15 p.m. We assume that during this 80 minute period, the court also had time for lunch. Even if we assume that the entire 80 minutes was spent in deliberation on this case, each individual accused received about a minute and a half of deliberation. This callous disregard of even perfunctory justice is amazing. Again, we are now making space for more time to be devoted to these issues. And one of the things that we're pointing to is that if it was, it was a rush proceeding where everyone was treated as a unitary object, and it's inconsistent with our values. All right. Just to zero in a little bit on some of the legal arguments we're making, um, there is a right to counsel problem. If you have five lawyers representing 50 people in a capital case, uh, the, the obvious and immediate flaw there is that each individual person needs to have complete counsel in order to have an effective uh, defense. An effective defense has been in the Sixth Amendment since 1791. And the Supreme Court recognized before 1945 that this was a right that uh, applied. There's the famous case of the Scottsboro Boys, which was uh, from the 1930s. The Supreme Court decided a case in 1932. And there they decided that the Sixth Amendment required uh, that the, the men in that case not meet their attorney just on the morning of trial, right? This had to go to the Supreme Court in order to be established in 1942. It was followed up by a case called Glasser in 1942, where the Supreme Court reversed the conviction. And there, uh, the issue was that um, the co-defendant and Glasser were both represented by the same lawyer, right? There were two clients and one lawyer there. But some of the evidence tended to incriminate only one of them. And so it put the lawyer in a conflict of interest situation. Do I, do I allow that evidence against one but not against the other? How do I counsel one versus the other? The Supreme Court ruled that that violated the co-defendant's uh, Sixth Amendment rights. So similarly here, although Marshall and others actually had some uh, kind words and compliments for these five lawyers, the idea that five people could represent 50 is inconsistent with an effective defense under the Sixth Amendment. So that's our first legal issue. We also have the issue of the exculpatory evidence. So all evidence either tends to make you more guilty or tends to uh, establish that you're not guilty. Exculpatory evidence um, tends to establish your innocence or at least question your guilt. Inculpatory evidence is the evidence that is used to convict you. So they, in this trial, they allowed the evidence that helped the prosecution but excluded evidence that would have helped the defendants. For example, uh, there was evidence that the men did not have the intent to take over uh, authority. Well, that's an element of mutiny. Mutiny is, we are going to, through an armed uprising, become the authority here. You're no longer going to be in charge of this ship, Captain Queen, right? That's mutiny. Well, here there was ample evidence that the men didn't have that kind of intent. Their intent was to point out a problem that if it could be fixed, then everyone could go back to work. That's not mutiny. And that evidence was excluded. Along with the evidence that they had pointed out to the Navy 
before the explosion that there was this great danger. And there were regulations that the Coast Guard had in place that required the Navy to give safety training and other uh, steps that were not given before the sanitation was loaded. None of that was allowed because this was a case that had to result in a guilty verdict. That's a problem. And the Supreme Court had decided that also before 1945. There's a, uh, there's a famous case out of California. Uh, I don't know if you've all heard of the, prepared, the Preparedness Day explosion in San Francisco in 1917. It was, uh, it was there, it was, a, it was a parade to get the community ready for World War I. And there was an explosion that killed several people. And it was thought that these anarchists had done it because they were opposed to the US going to World War I. But one man was framed with perjured testimony. His name was Tom Moody. And the, the fact of the perjury came to light within two years. Um, and his sentence was commuted by the governor to life. But he saw his exoneration because it actually was perjury. The only testimony placing him at the scene was perjury testimony. And the prosecutor knew it. It was another 20 years before the governor of the state exonerated him. And that is the case of Mooney versus Holohan. It's a 1935 Supreme Court case where the Supreme Court said that when a prosecutor suppresses favorable evidence that the defense could have used, that violates due process. It's exactly what happened in this trial. And it's already the law of the land. I already mentioned before the problem with the statements. Uh, the men were either tripped or threatened in many cases, to give statements against the 50. And uh, there are many examples of this. Um, and it did come out of the trial somewhat. The court martial decided that it wasn't, uh, it didn't exonerate the men. This one was weighed a little bit at the trial. But there was more evidence that could have been developed of this. And, pardon me, this is a, this is a very serious defect in the proceeding. To take evidence uh, and use it at trial where you have threatened a witness in order to extract the statement violates our fundamental <coughs> principles of justice. It's not allowed. Finally, there is no evidence of an actual conspiracy. Uh, they were charged with conspiracy to commit duty. The great thing about conspiracy as a charge is that if you can prove the agreement between two or more people to do something that's illegal, that evidence against one can oftentimes be evidence, evidence, evidence excuse me, against the co-conspirators. You do have to prove an agreement. Whether it's a written agreement or not is beside the point. Often it's not a written agreement. People don't usually get together and write down, hey, let's go commit this crime together. I'll sign it here and you sign it. <laughs> agreement is usually proven through circumstantial evidence. But there was no attempt to prove an agreement and there was no evidence that could, that could be sufficient enough to sustain the conviction on that ground. All right. Some other issues that we have raised in our advocacy. We believe that these convictions resulted from racial discrimination and systems that created and then reinforced inequality. We think that there's a lack of due process in the record. We think that the conduct at issue was actually a legitimate form of protests that we would want members of our military to be able to do, right? If you think about a more modern example, uh, you may recall that at Abu Ghraib prison in 2008, what came to light were these horrible photographs of prisoners being tortured, right? Someone had to take a stand and say, this isn't right, and I'm gonna tell the media about this. We want the members of our military to be able to act on their conscience now, they can be disciplined if it's appropriate, but to say that this is mutiny is to, is to, is to, over, is to over describe this. All right, lawful dissent against an unlawful order. I mentioned before there are regulations that uh, prohibited this, that the Navy should, they were following the regulations, would have trained the men, would have provided safety equipment, and would have slowed the uh, demands on their time so that it can be done safely. We also think that it's an immoral order that when uh, when the sailors let the uh, 
commanding officers know that it was dangerous. At that point, um, a, a moral approach would have been to make sure that it was safe. So today, we want these men to be remembered as courageous Americans who served their country with dignity and grace under adverse conditions. We also hold them up as civil rights heroes. I haven't told you that part of the story yet. This episode of our history led directly to the desegregation of the Navy in 1946, which led directly to the desegregation of all of the branches of the military by executive order signed by President Truman in 1949. The people that made those decisions pointed to a number of things. But they pointed to the Port of Chicago 50 as one example of why the military should no longer be segregated. These 50 men had a lot to do with helping to create the modern military that we can all feel good about. At the time, this was the largest fighting force that had ever been assembled in the history of the world. And for, for it to be desegregated after so many years is a monumental step of progress. These men should be celebrated for that, and that's one of our arguments for why they should be exonerated, so that they can be rightly credited as civil rights heroes. These also are, are men whose cry for justice has not yet been answered by this nation. Fundamentally, they answered the call to serve the United States at the time when the country needed them the most, World War II. And when they needed justice and fairness, both in 1945 and in the years since, the country has not yet responded. And so we are pressing as hard as we can uh, to get the Navy to correct this, to correct this injustice. Let's talk about, briefly, about what you can do to help. We would love to have your help. One idea is uh, you could send a letter and or an email or a phone call to the Secretary of the Navy and they give you the contact information. We also have two sort of exemplar letters. One is very short, it just says, here I am, I'm, if it was me, I'm a 58-year-old resident of Contra Costa County, I'm writing to request that you exonerate the Port Chicago 50. A couple of other sentences, very truly yours, and the email address, and there you go. Another letter is a longer discussion about some of the legal issues, if that's of interest to you. Either one of those, or your own letter. Phone calls. We have had phone banking to this number that I'm going to give you, and we've heard reports that it is making a difference. If we were going to get 100 phone calls from Ross Moore in the next three days, that would make a difference. Also, we have a petition. It's on change.org. There's tw almost 2,300 signatures on it. The young men that I introduced before are going to be out there. They can pull it up with an iPad. You put your name, your address. I, there's minimal information that you have to put in, and you can be added to the list of signatories. Here's, here's the letter. I just, I just typed this up this morning. Just I wanted you to see an example of something. Um, Dear Secretary Del Toro, I am a 58-year-old resident of Long Creek. This is me, I'm not a resident of Boston. At least not yet. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm, writing, I'm writing to request that the Navy remove the convictions from the records of the Port of Chicago 50. The Newton trial was deeply flawed, as, been, as has been documented by Thurgood Marshall and Dr. Robert Allen, among others. Next month is the 80th anniversary of the explosion at Port Chicago which is an opportune time for the Navy to take this step. Last year, the Army did likewise for the soldiers at Camp Logan, convicted in 1917. Please act on this 80-year-old cry for justice, explanation point. Maybe you like that, maybe you have your own version. But this is available, I provided the, uh, the Word file uh, to, to Kappa for this short letter, and then there's a longer letter. So hopefully that could be made available to people. And this is an email address that we have apparently verified is used by the secretary. It may not look like it. I think what they do is they usually put a public email address out that an assistant checks once every month. 
or something like that. But this is apparently a really bad person. And this is a phone number. 703-695-3131. We do know that Carlos Del Toro is someone who cares about justice issues. There's no question about it. And so we are not talking to a, uh, you know, a brick wall here. We're talking to a human being who cares about these issues. Sometimes they just need to hear enough voices in order to take that step. And knowing how committed you are to drawing out of this country the very best that one can be, and lived your lives that way and being active in that cause, we wanted to just see if, if, if you'd be interested in helping with this cause, we would love to have your support. Um, thank you so much for, for listening to me. I'm sorry I went on too long. Are there any questions I would have to answer?
about these principles being applicable. There's just no question about it. So I don't think that it would erode anything in terms of military independence, the need for uh, a military justice scheme that emphasizes um, chain of command and fidelity to the mission. I, I think we all understand that. But there has to be a role for our bedrock principles to also operate, even in a military court. Questions? How many of the 50 are still alive? They're all deceased. They all, oh, they are all They're all deceased. deceased. So it's, are, is there any unit for the families? Are we asking for that at all? We, we have not made that a part of our effort. Uh, and I, I don't know the, how that would turn out, but I think it's fair to say that if they are exonerated, by that I mean the convictions are expunged, then they would be given a different discharge, which would be honorable. And at that point, I do think that there's probably some discussion that would have to take place. But I don't know, it's beyond anything that I've researched, and it's not something we're asking. Is a question. How does one make a reservation to go to the commemoration event? Uh, I am going to, I'm going to, I'm going to test drive this as we're talking about it to make sure. I think if you go to the Friends of Port Chicago, this is a nonprofit. Friends of Port Chicago, and on their website, okay, they have not put it up yet. This still is talking about the 79th commemoration, but there will be a page like this. It's probably going to come up soon, and there's a link to register. Can we put that on our, our update, too? Yes, I'm also going to test drive the Port Chicago National Park Service site because I would imagine they needed Martinez in the board of us. Okay. On the at, at NPS.gov there is Port Chicago 80th anniversary event. We are now accepting reservation requests for the 80th anniversary. Please follow the link to and NPS is National Park Service. Dot, dot com. I'm sorry? NPS.gov. NPS.gov. And then you go to the Port Chicago Naval Magazine. You know, uh, Carol has once again rescued me from my own uh, dithering. The, so the, the, the piece of paper that's at your table, if you, if you go to this website that's at the top, OceanPopperWeekend.org, you can register, you can register for all the events, and the commemoration is on the top of the landing column. We would, we would love to see you at our workshop, which is on July 19th, and then there are details on the back. So we're going to have community leaders, uh, faith-based leaders and some family members and descendants. And then, if there's any extra time, I might hear me talking about it, I'm not sure. <laughs> the question is, is it difficult to get out to the site? And the answer is, uh, you have to give them uh, your identifying information. They'll need a birth date, they'll need a driver's license, they'll need a photograph when you show up. Because this National Park Service is a small plot of land surrounded by an active military base. And so the military actually controls access. And so it's unfortunate that someone without a driver's license or some other form of government issued photo ID may not be able to make this. If you have a passport, yeah, you have to give your info in advance and they have to approve you. Okay. 
It's well worth the effort. I'll just say that. I've been out several times. And this is a good reminder that we have to be registered to them. <laughs> Any more questions? I have to say this is, oh, here's the question. I visited the site, and it's, it's certainly very moving. Uh, two things I remember from the uh, explanation by the Park Service representative. Number one, he told us that this is the least visited national park in the United States. Number two, he related that the white officers would divide the black workers into teams, and they would bet against each other as to which team could load the fastest. Oh my God. Oh. Emphasizing speed over safety. Yeah. Yes, sir, I'm so glad you mentioned both of those points, actually. Uh, the, uh, I was at the, the National Park Service that was the previous winter of the East Visited site. It's called Hovenby, and it's in the middle of nowhere in Utah. Uh, this is much easier for us to get to, and we can change that ranking by showing up on, on the 20th of July. To your more important point, you're right. Um, there was one piece of testimony that shed light on this. Uh, the witness was Ali Green. He was the oldest of the Polish government. He was 37. And there was a there was a sort of a routine at the end of each testimony. All 50 men testified in their effects. At the end, the general who was running the court first would say, do you have anything else you want to tell us? And most of the men being very young and scared and had very little to say. Mr. Green said, yeah, I do. I knew something bad was going to happen because they made us race against each other and they bet on us. They, were, they would get the benefit of the quick filling up times and it would help them in their career. And they also wanted to wager on us. But we were just, we were just used like that. And that was an unexpected piece of testimony because that had all been excluded by rulers beforehand, but since the court asked him, he just he said that. So that's sworn testimony that confirms that. Thank you for mentioning that. Did they ever confirm what caused the explosion, actually? Well, I think the, the mechanism of the explosion is known because it's all the munitions. The question of what precipitating event caused or triggered the ignition has never been definitively um, decided or, or learned, and I don't think it can be. Uh, there was some testimony that the men were told that the munitions, at different times they were told that the munitions were, were not live wired, because when they complained, like, hey, there's not, that's a big bomb that's rattling against the inside hull of the ship there. That looks really dangerous. Don't worry about it, it doesn't have a live fuse. Well, we know that's not true. Um, but it's interesting that someone felt the need to tell them that. Uh, that was uh, perhaps created in some of the men the idea that they could load more quickly if they believed that statement. So there's too much like that that's difficult to sort out to really know. And the explosion being as massive as it was, the men at the center of the explosion were literally obliterated. Nothing left. I have to say, I, I mean, if there are no more questions, I, then possibly you share with me how grateful I am that in this 80 years later, that you're working for this. That this is this United States to be. And I think justice anytime, uh, no matter how long it takes, is really, really worth pursuing. So at this time when we're all depressed and terrified, I mean, so, I, I personally am so grateful to you and the task force for working on this, and I hope we can help with it. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Signing. Uh, so we can sign the petitions before you go. Yeah.
go to the front and sign so we can at least have uh, use today as a starting point for us and using our support. And, and if you decide that you want to send a letter or an email, would you please let us know that you've done it so we can. Yeah, we do have a group that does write and call, they call, so we can we can include that in our uh, club. Yeah. I, the petition I'll be able to tell because the number will grow. I would love to know. I would love to know kind of the, the timing and the, and the volume of that. Also, I'm hoping that yeah.